Welcome to the Shema Podcast, the podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwine through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. I have with me today Rabbi Yaakov Cohen to talk about something that is of vital importance for every Jewish man, all my Jewish brothers to understand. And before I bring him on to discuss this, I want to tell first what is it that I'm referring to and also talk about my process of learning what this is and how to fulfill this very vital mitzvah. And the mitzvah I'm referring to is bris milah. Now, I always thought it was strange when I first started becoming religious and studying Torah 10 years ago that this very important mitzvah of circumcision was so important, so binding to the Jewish people. It didn't make any sense because if God wanted us to not have a foreskin, then why not just make us without a foreskin? But I didn't really understand what this all was referring to. For one, I learned that because I had a circumcision— it was not a bris milah because my parents didn't know any better and they had a medical doctor circumcise me the day after birth. So I had to learn that that's not a bris milah. I had to go back and do that on the, it was, it's supposed to be done the eighth day by a moil. I had to have a rabbi do this for me. But more importantly, what I've learned over the years is what this mitzvah means, what it is a symbol of and what it represents is not what I was doing at all my entire life, especially as someone who was not religious, growing up, never being exposed to Torah. I didn't understand any of these things. And, and the, the power behind bris milah, that covenant, is that we are elevating ourselves beyond the animal. We are having our, our souls take control and submit our will to that of our eternal, infinite creator and not act like an animal when it comes to these areas of sexuality. When I was growing up, I was very sexually active from a very early age. I did not know what the Torah teaches us, that there's an organ of our body. If we feed it, it'll become more hungry. And if we starve it, it'll become satiated. I did not understand that. So in my 20s, I dated for one sole purpose, and that was for the opportunity to have sex. And because I was constantly feeding it, it was always wanting more, different women. And then I also realized that the damage I was doing by looking at women as not being these these holy neshamas in a body, but simply being there as an object for my own delights. And when I got married, I'm very grateful, thank God, that my father impressed upon me that when you get married, the lowliest thing a man can do is cheat on his wife. So that is something I never considered. However, my wife and I grew up in an environment where we were taught if you can look but not touch. The other thing I was exposed to growing up that we all have been is that this idea of masturbation has been so normalized in our culture. I remember in the 90s watching sitcoms like Friends where they would joke about looking at pornography and masturbating. There was an episode of Seinfeld, a famous one. I think it's called The the Bet or something along those lines where Jerry Seinfeld and his friends are sitting around and they and they start talking about this. And Jerry says, oh, it's like brushing your teeth. You got to do it in the morning. And that was my take. And then they all made a bet and this wager on who could go the longest without self-satisfying themselves. I think when they all got back from the restaurant, Kramer comes in the room, slaps down his money and says, I'm out. He's like, we've only been gone from the restaurant for like 20 minutes. He's like, I saw this woman on the way home. So that's what I grew up with. We all did. Many of those who have been outside the Torah observant community, and it's become so normalized. And so when I got married, I had such lust built up inside of me that my wife was not interested in satisfying that for me. So she knew I would take care of these matters. As you would say, that's a problem you need to solve with your own hands. And we didn't know any better. And we would make jokes about it. We would be out and I would see a beautiful woman dressed seductively. And she would say, so uh, is she going to be in those little movies you run in your head? And I always make this joke just like, yeah, baby, but you're the star. They're just extras on the set. And she did not realize the damage this was doing to her on a spiritual level, on a psychological level, because this is what the world was telling us, that this was totally permissible. 
and this was even happening when I began studying Torah. And I would come across, I remember a Talmudic verse that said, if something to the effect that if a man can't control himself in this area, it's better if his hands are chopped off. I remember reading that early on going, whoa, I don't like that. So I went to look for other opinions and they're on there online. People that call themselves rabbis that would say in their blogs, that was totally permissible, but these are not rabbis. They're people with the title rabbi. And I said, okay, I like their opinion because I couldn't imagine not being able to do that because it seemed like just this an, an urge that the body needed to release, like go in the bathroom. I, I couldn't imagine this. And I would come across text from time to time and I would just, just overlook it. And the other thing that really bothered me when I first started studying Torah was understanding that Hashem knows not only our actions and our words, but he knows our thoughts. That idea bothered me to no end at the beginning of my studies because I knew what my thoughts were many times. And I, I don't want Hashem in my mind when I'm, I wanted those just to be mine. But, but over time, as I began to study, and I started reading a book called The Garden of Purity by Rabbi Arush. And I got on a plane one day to return home and I was reading this book. And now it was, I was finally understanding what this meant and what I've been doing because the book, he sort of is very repetitive in a lot of the concepts by design because it's sometimes we just need her over and over again because our yet so raw is just trying to get us to say, no, it's okay. Remember that one rabbi you read online, his blog, it's okay. But then I really started to understand the gravity of it. And I'm not an emotional guy. The first time my wife ever heard me cry was after our daughter was born. I went around after she gave birth and my the nurses were preparing her and she put her little hand around my finger and I didn't even know what was happening to me. I just burst out in tears. My wife would always call me Spock from the character Star Trek from the original series because she said, you don't have any emotion. You just respond to everything analytically and without any uh, emotional context. And so when I burst out in tears, she yelled out, what's wrong with my husband? What's wrong? Because she never saw me do that. But those were tears of joy. When I was on the plane that day and the plane was taking off and I understood the gravity of what I've been doing, I burst out into tears as well. But those were tears of shame. And I remember I had to get my composure very quickly because I was sitting on a plane next to another man. And I looked out the window to distract myself and got my composure. And then I pulled out my laptop and decided to, to get to work and get my mind off of it. And then I remember thinking to myself, what happens when you die? Because that shame I felt burned so bad to know that what I've been doing is, is so distant from God and, and what he brought me into this world to do. And I was just thinking, when I die, I can no longer distract myself. I'm no longer in a body with all its sensory perception tied to the world around me. I'm just going to be left there with that total shame. And it burns. And my theory, to me, it seemed like that is what fuels the fires of Gehenna. It's, it's just the shame of being in the presence of the Almighty. And I really wanted to remember that feeling because I knew it would motivate me to do the change I needed to do. And on my way back from the airport home that day, I did call my, well, my rabbis, Rabbi uh, Yokoff Wolby, because I was pretty broken down. And he reminded me of Teshuvah. And I wanted just to say it out loud to someone. This is what I've been doing because I, I wanted to make sure I, I changed. And so this process was very challenging because I had been fueling these movies in my head. And my Yetzirah was more than happy to be the executive producer of all these movies. And I had to get all those thoughts out of my head. And it, you know, it started with going to a mikvah. Every morning I'd, I'd wake up early and read Rabbi Nachman's Tikkun, which Rabbi Cohen can discuss more of that which have cleansing effects to our soul. And it was just a lot of praying. Every morning when I would get up to study Torah, after I would say those 10 Psalms, I would get up to study Torah. And that's when the a man's testosterone is at its, its height. And when you've been feeding that every morning, that's when I would get hit with that urge. And I, I, and I would just sit there and, and just practice what Rabbi Rush said, just I just prayed, heartfelt tears. Hashem, please channel this energy towards passion for you in my Torah studies. I was marking off 40 days in my calendar because I know 40 has a very spiritual component to it of change. And I would fall sometimes and I would set the clock over again. But finally, I got through that 40 days. And now when I look back on it, being just cleansed of that, it makes the world of difference. For one, I know that I'm, I'm fulfilling that covenant with the Almighty. I'm, I'm doing this for myself. I'm not an animal. You know, an animal goes out there and acts on an urge. Our society 
almost elevates men when they act like animals. I see ads all the time where there's men getting lots of women. They, they idolize them. That's being macho. That's being masculine. And Hashem and Torah are saying it's just the opposite. They're acting like extremely feminine. They're acting like animals. There's nothing to give them any type of value at all for behaving that way. And so this is such an important topic that I, I want all my brothers out there to, to know exactly what it is doing to us when we do participate in this or any type of sexual immorality, that there's a proper way even with our wives of doing things in a holy and modest way. And to make sure that whether it's at that point in time when your soul is pulled from your body, you stand before the Almighty, I don't want any of you to ever feel the burning shame of knowing that you didn't have the opportunity to do teshuva for this in this world. Or as we know, we're in the doorsteps of Mashiach, and I don't want any of us to get caught with our pants down, figuratively or literally, when it comes to this matter. So I will now bring on Rabbi Cohen. Rabbi, thank you so much for coming on to talk about this very important topic. Pleasure to be here. Thanks, Dan, for inviting me. It is a touchy topic, isn't it? Yes, indeed. Yeah, in the religious world, definitely it is so danced or so lightly upon in the recesses really hardly spoken about, tried shove it, more like shoved under the carpet as much as possible. Even though nowadays there is classes that are going on around the world in order to help people young and old with this issue. And it is an issue. So yes, I do share a lot of these, the same experience, because don't forget, I was also not raised in the religious world, raised in the sunny beaches of California, where everything was basically opened and everybody was running after everything and whatever the skies will live in, whatever your eyes sees, go after. And I also was not aware of the idea of keeping the covenant. We'll call it Shmir Tabrit, keeping the covenant, guarding the covenant. Uh, until I got to yeshiva. And even then, it was months, a few months in when I was exposed to a text that also made me cry and probably, you know, made me also shake to realize that, whoa, I had no idea that the Torah, how, how the Torah views this activity. Because, of course, nowadays, and it probably was then and it's more now, that the psychologist will all say, and the world will say, this is a natural thing to do. It's part of your nature. It's what we do. And the Torah teaches that it's not so. And the inner reason why is because that they, science is not proven, but all of the Kabbalistic texts come and tell us that the seed of a man comes from the brain. It comes from the mind. It comes from the highest place. As a matter of fact, I think even also physiology, I'm not sure where I read it in what book, that, you know, at the time that there is an ejaculation, all of the body, as well as the mind, donates their best for the arrows that are shot forward, okay? In other words, it's a portion of yourself that you're giving over. And the idea here is that the mind and the body, this is potential life. The seed is called potential life, that it can impregnate. And even if, let's say, a person is with a woman who cannot get pregnant for whatever reason, for whatever reason, there's still, we have handed down, that there's still a neshama, a soul that is created with this powerful act, because this is a unbelievable source or an energy of a life-giving process. It is, in a certain way, an ultimate giving, a man's ultimate giving of the self. He's giving his seed over to create the future, to create a person. So in, in doing that, if it's wasted and put not in the proper place, so then that's called wasted potential. So therefore... We have in Torah tradition something called Tuma. The word Hebrew word for Tuma is literally translated as defilement, but it really is not the proper definition for Tuma. Tuma really means this, a lack of life energy. So there's different levels of this lack of life energy. The most strongest lack of life energy is a corpse. Why? Because it had a soul in it, and the soul now has left the body and nature abhors a vacuum instantly that goes into this body. It's with this lack, extreme lack of life energy. It, we'll call it a darkness or a tuma. And that makes it the highest level of tuma, okay, that we have, a, a corpse. And then there's lower levels of tuma when somebody touches a dead lizard. That is also a lack of life energy. 
that this person has come in contact with. There's the woman in her cycle. The woman in her menstrual cycle. It's not that she's Tuma. It's not that she is defiled. But really, there is a, there's, there was a potential life that is now running out. That is gone. That's the egg that is running through her body. It's not her per se. It's a lack of life energy. And the same thing goes by the seed of a per man. Even though that there's probably, I don't know how many sperm cells come out that a person ejaculates, but it is still called a, a potential life. And so, therefore, there's going to be a lack of life energy if it goes definitely to the wrong place. I don't want to get into scary stories or scary stuff. But, interestingly enough, that Adam had a first wife. Adam had a first wife. I'm not going to say her whole name. We're not allowed to say. He had a first wife and her name was Lil. We don't say her whole name. We're not allowed to say her whole name. And because we are very subtle energies and to say her whole name, well, we're going to be introduced to it. In any case, Adam and and Lil, the first wife, had an argument. I won't go into the details of that argument. And basically what happened is because of this little argument, God took Lil and took her out of the Garden of Eden. And then, of course, God had made Eve. And, of course, he made Adam to go to sleep. He created Eve from the side or the rib. And then, of course, Adam was joined with his flesh of flesh, bone of bone, with his wife, Eve. Now, Lil is outside the Garden of Eden, seeing her ex get remarried. And I wonder what that would be going on in her mind. She's not too happy. Just to play it out in terms of the drama. Of course, all of these things have different and a higher scale metaphor. But just for us, in terms of the storyline, that's how it goes. Okay. But of course, these represent Kabbalistic energies and flows of energies. And really, it is the creation of free will. So as it goes, Eve or Eve got married to Adam. Lil is outside of the Garden of Eden, is not too excited about this. As a matter of fact, she's really mad. She's mad at God and she's mad at Adam and she's going to take her revenge. And how does she do it? So after this whole, that whole incident there, Adam had Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel. Adam separated from his wife for 130 years. And in those years, every single night, wherever Adam was, Lil would come to him. Actually, Lil, and she had another friend, Nama. They would come with cerveza and tequila, and they would have a nice hot tub party. And basically, how that's interpreted in Kabbalistic texts is, Adam had a lot of seminal emissions. And through those seminal emissions, there were certain entities that were born. And you talk about 130 years of entities that were born. And the point of what I'm saying is that when the seed doesn't go into the right place, It doesn't mean, okay, it's dead, move on. There is some effect of that action. Like there's an effect of every single one of our actions. It happens to be in the spiritual realm, there's a huge effect to this action. It does give birth to something. And when a man is with with his wife in holiness, and whether it's for the sake of having an actual child or not, then there's still a entity, a spiritual entity that is produced. And just to end it off here to let you go to the next point, which is, it says when Abraham and Sarah left Haran, it says they brought the souls, all the souls that they made in Haran. And the commentary, some of the commentaries bring down, what does it mean, the souls that they made in Haran? That means that every time that they were together, even though they could, they weren't having any physical children, they gave birth in the spiritual realm to many, 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 many children in the spiritual realm. And only later we find, actually, this is why people who convert, they always will call them after they convert, this is so-and-so son of Abraham, or this lady is now so-and-so son of Sarah. They're always going to be Ben Abraham or Ben Sarah because... We say that those were the souls that Abraham and Sarah created. And now, only now, thousands of years later, are there's their chance to come into this world. So, just in short, the seed is a very, very high potential energy. So, therefore, we always try to, you know, use it for its holiest purpose. So, it sounds like that whether we are engaged in that act in a holy way, with our wife in a proper way of modesty, then it's still creating something very positive. Absolutely. Even if a baby doesn't occur from that. Yes. And if we do it in a negative way, 
it's creating something very negative as well. Right. Because that is the thought that I learned about the idea that I learned about early on that, that really freaked me out when I had to come and talk to Shauna and tell her how this was wrong, how I'm going to be going through this process, the damage I've been doing to her talking about that. Apparently that Lil conceives with this spilt seed. And I told her, apparently I have, you know, hundreds and hundreds of demon children or whatever they are who never once got me a father's day card, but I have, thank God, a process for ridding them through Rabbi Nachman's tikkun through these processes. But, you know, I, I did bring you on. So I did want you to share what does is happening in the, in the spiritual realm. And yeah, it's a little scary, but I think that truth, understanding that brings some gravity to anyone who's struggling with this to say, I, I need to change. And then we can talk about the path forward on how, how to go about breaking ourselves of this behavior. I know where I came from. I was in, I was in an all out war. Okay. Because I got to yeshiva when I was 19 and in yeshiva, you're, you know, it's an all men's school and, uh, you know, and there's no dating until you're ready to only to get married. And even though, let's say my body wanted to get married right away because my hormones were raging, I still wasn't on the right mental attitude and level of maturity to get married, obviously, because Hashem kept me there for 10 years. And so you have a lot to fight with and, and grasp with, but there are a lot of what we call eightses, uh, advice. There's a lot of advice, baby steps to try to get one and, and never, the, the biggest rule always was never despair. The biggest rule always, and Rabbi Nachman always teaches this, is you have to always be happy. You never can let yourself get down. In other words, even if you fall, you got to bounce right back. And you got to fight with all you've got. And believe me, a lot of falling, a lot, you know, I, I mean, I tell you, it got to a point where I slept in the Beit Midrash, in the study house, for years on a hardwood bench with the lights on glaring at me just so I would be able to have control over this. That was kind of extreme. I don't advise it, but I'm telling you there's always a path. But num rule number one is if you fall, you bounce back up. Never allow yourself get depressed. The evil inclination, that's the first thing, the greatest thing he wants you to do is to be despair and get depressed. So you have to always be resilient. Yeah, the, the yets are raw sort of like me in my 20s. Like I was the guy that would, when my I was out drinking with my friends, that would urge them on to do something really stupid for my entertainment. And then the next morning when I was billing them out of jail, I'd be like, why'd you do that? That was stupid. And you're like, you're the one that told me to take that shot and go do that. I was that guy. That's basically the yetzer raw is a jerk like that. It's like, yeah, yeah, do it. And then after you do it, it's like, man, you are really a pitiful individual for doing that. And you're like, you're the one that talked me into doing that. But that is the MO. And that, and that is something I think it's, you're right. It's very important to remember is, is staying joyful and moving forward. I'm, I'm curious to know too what your thoughts are on why this is not something that you see a lot of rabbis in outreach talking about. My theory is that is because maybe fulfilling those other mitzvot, beginning Torah study are, are easier, or I mean, those build up the strength to then take on that challenge and fulfill the, the covenant. That's a great idea. That's exactly actually what the Gomorrah does say, that if the, uh, if the maneuver, if the disgusting one happens to breach you, bring him to the house of study which is the maneuver is the evil inclination. If he happens to hit you, so you got to turn yourself to Torah because Torah is the remedy against the evil inclination. So I would assume that, yes, the rabbis are, don't, a lot of rabbis, most rabbis, don't go head on to this because you're right. First of all, it's too big a mountain. You're talking about you're going against the entire world. People hear this idea of it being, you know, guarding the covenant. That's like from somebody from outside would look at that at a surface way and say, that's ridiculous. This is the way of nature. This is the way. So, okay, first you have to educate in Torah, and then you have to, they have to understand the potential that is in this act. And it is the holiest of holies, by the way. We do look at the house, a person's house, as being the mini temple, mini Beit HaMikdash. Your table is like the altar. Your kitchen is where they would slaughter the offerings. And actually, you'd light the Shabbos candles as like the menorah. And actually, 
you know, in terms of every single chamber or place that they would have in the temple, it has its counterpart, the Holy of Holies that's in the temple where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's the tablets that Moses brought down is the bedroom, which I'm sure you've heard that before. I have not. Oh, yes. That's the Holy of Holies. So it, it actually deserves, in terms of what a person thinks and all of the laws and all of the customs that go into it. But for the meantime, a person has to know this is a very holy act. And so once a person knows the potential, the high potential of it, right, so once you understand the spiritual potential of this, so then you'll be more sensitized and be aware of it. But then, of course, there's the many other positive aspects to guarding the covenant, such as your prayers are answered, your fulfillment, you feel you've risen above. It's just this what makes a man a man. And, you know, people think not so. So you're right. It's going totally against the grain of the world. But this is what the Torah says. And we have to accept that this is a huge force of holiness for everybody. And therefore, we have to do whatever we can to stay in holiness, because that really is our power. You know, even back when I was engaging in that, the reason you know it's not like any other bodily function is because that function only happens if you entertain thoughts. It can't happen with in the absence of thoughts. And the thoughts always would become, you know, more demand. So that right there shows that there's something, obviously, it's not like some other bodily function. Yeah, so now you're getting into something else. You're getting into kind of like what areas or what advice can we start in terms of the path? So... The first path really is watching the eyes, okay? I, I, you mentioned thoughts, but I go first because usually, yes, the person's thoughts can wander. And a person, actually, we say a person does not makshe. His limb does not get hard unless there's a will, okay? In other words, there has to be thoughts. But I say before thoughts is once you watch your eyes. The first thing is, and it's a hard one, but it can be done to... You have to start to watch your eyes. You have to start to watch what you see on the internet. You start to watch on the street. And you start to watch your eyes. Because the evil inclination only dwells on what the eyes see. If the eye doesn't see it, the evil inclination has no power. And isn't that what the, when we read the Shema and it discusses the seat seat, that that is what that is there for, is to remind us to not wander after our eyes? Yes, Right, because the eyes will take you to somewhere else. And then once the eye sees, as we have handed down, the heart desires, and then the body goes after. So it starts with the eye seeing, and then your thoughts. The eyes are the first project energy or capturer of energy that comes out of the mind. It's the first thing. So therefore, once you got it in the eyes, you've, you've major, you've done a major, you're, you've triumphed majorly in terms of overcoming the first hurdle. The next, of course, is you got to watch your thoughts. And then, of course, words and what you hear is a next level. And then, of course, there's the the actual act itself. So when it comes to guarding our eyes, that is even so much more challenging today than ever. Because if you want to watch something entertaining, it's almost impossible to find a good series or a movie that doesn't have some scene in it with what? Yes, always. It's always going to, it's very, very difficult. So you need a mashkiach or a mashkicha, what we call it. You need a supervisor, a kosher supervisor. You need somebody there with you who will block your eyes. If you don't have somebody, well, then you, you, then, you know, okay, try to do it yourself. Listen, I'm not saying it's not challenging. It is probably the most challenging because it's something also in our society that we're not accustomed to do. Women walk around, you know, very immodestly dressed, you know, and uh, no one has ever taught and they don't teach it in schools. Hey, you know, you shouldn't be gazing. You shouldn't be looking. First of all, women shouldn't, whatever. It's going to be, this is what society is. We, we're, we're in it. And so therefore it's the man's responsibility to guard himself, to guard his covenant, to try to do the best he can to watch his eyes. So one of the first things I did was... I quit the gym where I worked out at and I built a gym here because the culture at the gyms are the purpose of clothing is to cover the parts of your body that you're not real proud of. And so the, the more the women would get into shape, the less clothing they needed. And it was just impossible. And 
So I just, I stopped going there. If I even have... A- you've got a bigger, you've got a bigger problem. Yeah, I agree. I also stopped the gym. I stopped the gym because I would go on the treadmill and there was this like 20, 30 screens of all kinds of stuff flashing in my, in my eyes. And I had to keep my eyes down. It wasn't working out, the music, whatever. I built my gym at home also. So let's talk about, you mentioned the benefits. What, there are rewards in this world as well. Like, I believe I read from Rabbi Nachman that the, the curse in Genesis that Adam would have to toil for his bread, that that curse gets lifted when the covenant is maintained. Yeah, there's a lot of statements. There's a lot of ideas like that in terms of the benefits that who a person who keeps the covenant, you know, how well connected he is and how well basically we'll call it the bounty, how the bounty flows. Okay, meaning the spiritual bounty, which has to do with it bleeds in all areas, not only just consciousness, but also actually your parnasa, meaning your finances. All of those things flow when a person keeps his covenant. The biggest paradigm we have of that is with Joseph. Now, Joseph, who was sold by his brothers down to Egypt, 17 years old, he's in the house of Potiphar, and the wife of Potiphar, you know, sees in the stars that she's destined to have a child from Joseph. So she's changing her clothes, and she's beautiful, changes in her clothes, prancing in front of Joseph, going, come on, let's do this. And here's Joseph, 17 years old, hormones raging, and he says, I can't. I would sin against God. It would result in unbelievable damage to me and to my family and to, and to the world. So he overcame a huge test that I don't know if any of us would be able to withstand. Nevertheless, because he did that, meaning he kept his covenant, he did not live with this married woman, he was able to be the conduit for all of the food supply of the entire world. Now, in the Kabbalistic sense, if you know, if you notice the ten spherot, Joseph corresponds to what we call Yesod. Yesod is called foundation. And also, all of the ten spherot correspond to our body parts. So you'll have three columns of the ten spherot, but there's the middle column, actually, and the ninth sphere of is called Yesod foundation, corresponds to Joseph, and also corresponds to the circumcision, that particular body part. So here he totally embodied the commitment of this body part, and that's what he really represents, commitment, the energy of I am committed. And therefore, because of that, if you know how the spherotic realms and the realms from heaven and the cosmic realm, how all of the shefa, all of the abundance, all of the blessing flows down, it always throws through, you sowed down to Malchut, the tenth sphera, right, which is the feminine sphera. So therefore, he became the conduit of all of the energy of the entire world because of his level of commitment. So, in other words, the idea here is level of commitment will enable a person not only has a connection to God, not only he'll have unbelievable insights, not only will his prayers be answered, but also his finances will be in order. Beautiful. How does kosher play into this? Because I, I got rid of sh- shellfish and pork very early, but I was still eating non-kosher meat and and poultry. And to me, after I went through this process, I realized what can make this easier, it seems, would be to eliminate the non-kosher meat, the non-kosher steaks because it has blood in it. And I just sort of reason that when you're eating a, a steak and it hasn't been killed in a, in a kosher way and it hasn't been bled, that you're basically consuming the animal's nefesh soul. And that would make this challenge of re- removing those thoughts and, and fixing myself in this area more challenging unless I got that pure kosher diet. Would you say that the the kosher diet definitely plays a role in fortifying ourselves in this area? First of all, your explanation I've never heard. It's quite interesting. I like it, that it has to do directly with that. But in a more general way with what our sages handed down, which is in, you know, could be in alignment with what you you saying. In general, someone who consumes non-kosher food, the Hebrew phrase for it, it's, The effect is it's metamtem, the lathe. What does it mean, metamtem? It means it blocks the heart. Now, it doesn't, we're talking about a physical heart here. So what I have seen, 
that people who have tried to get through to people who eat non-kosher is that they have a blockage. In other words, you th- you'll throw a piece of truth at them and it kind of like bounces off of them or they get kind of stoic and it doesn't penetrate because of blockage. A person who eats non-kosher food results in blockage. You can't, when the, when even if the truth hits you in the head, you might not grasp it. That's why you have person has to take the challenge, the kosher thought challenge, and go on a kosher diet for 30 days and see how they're thinking. See how they're thinking it, okay? Because you're, but, but in a certain sense of how you're saying it along those lines, okay, if you can't see the truth, that means it's not going to penetrate. So that means you're going to remain in the old patterns of behavior, which is the way of the world, which is look wherever you want, do whatever you want, chase whatever you want. So that's how kosher food, I would think, would be a, a help for it, but not the ultimate rectification. Did I reason that correctly? Because I always understood that the levels of the soul, that the nephesh is what resides in the blood. And that is what we share with animal kingdom. That is true. Now that's true. You know, bottom line, we don't have the, we don't have the reasons for kosher. As much as we can try to grasp and things might seem to line up. But we really don't know the underlying reasons why God prescribed these as kosher and these as not kosher. But we do have the effect of that if a person did eat kosher, there is going to be an effect. Even though, let's say, you can have all the good intentions in the world, you cannot expect to drink a cup of gasoline and, well, I didn't mean to, and it not to have an effect. It's going to have an effect. So in this way... If you look at the nephesh is in the blood, that is true for anything. The life force is in the blood. And it's true, we do say you are what you eat. And it does have an effect on the Jewish people in general. You could look at it as we only eat sheep, goats, and cows. We don't eat predators. No predatorial birds. So we have that kind of nature about us that we're not very predatorial. So that part of the nephesh, we could say, doesn't affect us. In other words, the... Uh, that part of the nephish of a non-kosher animal or a non-kosher slaughtered animal. So tell us about the, the, the process for, for change in this area. Like maybe if you could start off with Rabbi Nachman's tikkun and what he brought down. So, you know, usually when, believe me, in my war that I went through, my 10 year war, it was, you know, I went to many Kabbalists for rectification. I went to many, you know, people, rabbis for advice. And there are many pieces of advice. You know, like I was going to say earlier, you don't have glasses. I do. Like when I go to the airport, you know, I could take off my glasses and, you know, all the people who you in the gym, you know, now it doesn't matter. The clothes come off in the gym. No, they're coming. To, they wear the, the, the yoga pants. The world is just one big yoga pants. Okay. So, <laughs> It's like planet yoga pants, okay? So, you know, even in the airports, doesn't... I remember hearing a comedian going, doesn't anybody get dressed to go to the airport anymore? They just, like, roll out of bed and they're... So, you know, I take off my glasses. But because those that has to do with the eyes. But, you know, specifically, let's say, if, you know, those kind of things, you don't have glasses to take off and, and guarding your eyes is, of course, a big challenge. But let's talk about the thoughts. The biggest thing that Rabbi Nachman says, first of all, that he does talk about all of the desires of the world and the head of the taivas, the head of those desires is the desire for adultery, niuf, or whatever you'll call it promiscuity. So if a person, the best way to do that, actually, he says, quite simple, is to say the Shema. In other words, if you're hit with a thought and you can't get to a study house, whatever it is, wherever you're at, you say the Shema. Shema Israel, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you say the second phrase, Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Lelamwed, Blessed be His glorious name forever and ever. Blessed be His glorious kingdom forever and ever. So the the idea here of that Shema is a lot into it, believe it or not. That simply if you, what you're doing, when you go back into it, there's a lot into it, but it really, of course, is our basic mission statement. It gets us back into the mission that we're all here for. The one God, the one universal force. But more specifically, Rabbi Nachman goes into in Torah Lamed Vav, in Lakute Maharan. So when you say you, that's ex- exactly why actually when you say the Shema, you have to cover your eyes. Once again, there's an I thing there because you have to mamish like go as if you are blind. And then what it is, is there are the first sentence of the Shema is six words. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And the second phrase is also six words. Six plus six is twelve. Twelve is the twelve tribes of Israel. Let me tell you a story about the beginning of Shema. There's two times that actually it brings down in our Midrash when the Shema was said. You don't really see the Shema, which is a verse in the Torah till Deuteronomy, but, but in Genesis, there we have handed down, there were two times that the Shema was said. And one of those times was when Yaakov Avinu, Jacob our father, on his deathbed, all of the tribes were around him. He was about to tell over when the Messiah would come, when it would be the end of days. And all of a sudden, the prophecy left him. Lights out. And he was asking, why all of a sudden, when I had it, did God remove it from me? that I'm not supposed to reveal it? Maybe, he thought, one of you is not with the program. Maybe one of you is not totally committed to the mission, to the company. I have a traitor among you, perhaps. That's what Jacob said. And all of the sons, while they were around his father's deathbed, looked at each other right in the eye and said, all in unison together, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. Meaning, we are all totally on the mission. And then he responded with, Blessed be his glorious kingdom forever and ever. And the idea here is, each one of those six, and six is twelve, is the twelve tribes, basically. So when a person says Shema, he has to have in mind that he is taking his soul back up into the 12 tribes. Those six words. By the way, also, if you'll count the letters, there's 49 letters. If you'll count all of the letters of the 12 tribes, also 49 letters. So it's all lined up. So basically what it is, is also actually he brings exactly what really happens because the language is quite sweet. So he says here, so a person has to block his eyes. Because this rectification of thoughts of promiscuity, it comes to a man, that that's the, the tikkun is, that he should say the Shema and Baruch Shem, because this desire for promiscuity comes from actually me'achiras damim, from actually the thickness of the blood. Once again, you're talking about the blood. It comes from the dirt, the schmutz that's in the blood. That's really, he says, more specifically in the Tikkuni Zohar also brings this down, the Zohar in general. Mitachol, it comes from the spleen. Who is Lil? Lil resides in the spleen. Remember he talked about Lil in the Garden of Eden, Adam's first wife. She was Shifchabisha. She also has another name. She's called Shifchabisha, the evil maid servant. Ima de Erev Rav. She's also called the mother of the mixed multitude, the mother of the Erev Rav. She Malchus Harasha. She is the evil kingdom. So when a person says that, so what happens is he elevates and he takes all of the life force from her. And when he focuses on his ultimate mission that I am here to be an expression of the one God in a holy mission, my mission is very holy. So that what happens is he, they take basically the force of Lil away from her. It's almost like taking the uh, the piece of meat out of the dog's mouth. You know, you're ripping it out of the dog so the dog doesn't have food anymore. You're taking the batteries from the matrix and then the matrix naturally dies. Okay, that's probably the best metaphor. That's really actually how the the dark side loses in the end. The dark side dies in the end. There's no more life force in it. And therefore, it's gone. So when you say Shema, you're like sucking the life force out of the dark side, going into the light side, and boom. That is the biggest piece of advice that Rabbi Nachman says all the time. Yes, it works with anything. Works with any thought at all. But specifically this thought. But he says, he goes on later, he says, this is only if you get it once in a while. If you get it too much, then you got to say the Shema with tears, which is a whole nother topic to say the Shema with tears. But I will add this one thing. To say the Shema with tears, basically the commentary says that if you're in a state of sadness and you're crying for whatever reason, say the Shema then. And that, what happens is, they found, they discovered actually in science something quite interesting, that tears of sadness, they looked at the tears and there's actually poison in the tears. So as soon as I heard that from somebody who said that there's poison in those tears, I said, that's Rabbi Nachman, meaning the spleen, you suck the, the poison right out of the spleen, and then it's gone. In other words, you took the juice right out of Lil, and therefore you've ended the force or the grip of the evil inclination. To, to go back just a little bit more, you did mention Rabbi Nachman's tikkun. 
Tikkun HaKlali is very important. To say those 10 Tehillim, always very important. I was told that's only for a nocturnal emission, an accidental kind of thing. But you know something? To say Psalms all the time is always good. And if, you're gonna, if you don't have a lot of time to say all of the Psalms, if you got only a time to say 10, so would be definitely a huge benefit. Because he does say at the end, let's say it happened. Let's say it happened, a person fell. So like we sp- spoke before, those that energy goes to the dark side. Lil now takes that energy and has a hybrid creature in the spiritual side, what you would call a demon or, or a hybrid or something. You got to get it back. So the tikkun of Rabbi Nachman that tend to heal him suck those energy sparks back. So if a person has what we call a nafila, he fell. So therefore, they he always recommends to say those 10 psalms that the next day and therefore to get the holy sparks back so that when a person at the end of his life he's not greeted with 10 million children from the dark side that not one of them sent a father's day card so rabbi nachman's tikkun is only for a nocturnal emission not for so it has been taught to me but you know something i would say this generation we've fallen so low that you can't everybody is caught up and habits, and of course, the act, of course, a person has to make as much as a fight that he can, he must, but these things happen, a person does fall, still say it. In other words, even if it's not a nocturnal mission, I would recommend a person to say it nevertheless. The breast love, the breast love say it every day. Every day after the morning, morning service, every day, everybody says it. It was my understanding that they, there's a psalm for each of the 10 Sephiro, and it's sort of like this, any negative stuff you have on you at a spiritual level, it sort of is a cleansing process. Absolutely right. So like I said, it takes the whole sparks. There are holy sparks in the seeds. So you had to need to take, and they're caught in the dark side. Each one of the Tehillim takes it out from the 10 Sephiro of dark. What other uh, words of wisdom would you like to share on this topic to help out anyone that's struggling with it? Okay, so so now we do have certain laws. There are bodies of laws in how a person can guard himself, actually, in actuality, of course, because the path of tshuva is really always just stop, okay? Just stop. Forget about the, the thoughts. Forget about the, the, you know, all those are like safeguards to try, but, of course, if a person can stop. Now, there are safeguards in the physical realm which a person has to stop. It's better they, they recommend never put your hands down below your waist. I, people go to the bathroom. Okay, when you go to the bathroom, I'm talking about number one, so a person should not hold his limb. Because you're holding your limb, you're going to stimulate it. So they recommend hold the crown of the limb, or do any other way, don't touch the limb. When you're in the shower and you're washing, try to also not to stimulate. We try to do things not to stimulate. That's the thing. Not to engage in activity, not to look at things which could stimulate that activity, not to listen to things. All of those things go into into just the safeguards for it. I also heard, and I've noticed this too, that just crude talk, like I'll be with guys from work and they'll be, be at a conference, we'll go to a bar afterwards. And a lot of times there's just crude conversation, which I, I know before I go into that situation, it's going to be there. And I heard that just even in, engaging in that, even just trying to placate the guys and, and listen to it, where they're trying to be funny, it's crude, that also is something that can have a negative impact in this area. Thoughts, words, and action. It's always that. They all have an effect on us. So your thoughts, your words, words definitely have an effect, and your actions, of what you do with your hands. A lot of times, all of those three you have to safeguard, and all of them have an influence. Can you add any words with regard to spousal relationships? Because... It's my understanding, too, there is certain manners and times and ways to make sure that that is a holy endeavor. That is such a monster topic at the end of this podcast. To bring that up now, that is so loaded. I'm telling you, I could give a podcast on this for years. See you seriously. Because like I said, it's called the Holy of Holies. And what a man thinks. I mean, you shouldn't be thinking about anybody else. That's one thing for sure. And, uh, you know, and there are a huge, there's a body of laws in terms of relations. That's a whole nother ballgame. 
I'll tell you what, Rabbi, that sounds like a nice teaser for a follow-up interview to do on that topic as well. So I do want to thank you once again for taking the time to speak with us today to share your wisdom on this very important subject. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page.